High School Corporation will come to order. If you all will stand. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Remain in silence, please. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. President, I make the motion to approve the minutes for the May 23rd work, work session, the May 23rd regular meeting, and the May 23rd executive session. Second. Okay, I have motion second. Any additions, uh, corrections to the minutes? Seeing none, all in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Okay. Now for our reports. Um, Mrs. Circle. Uh, first of all, is there any questions for the administrators on the reports that has been sent to us? Does anybody got any questions or anything? Okay. One thing I'll ask is how is summer school going? Okay? Good? Thumbs up. That's good. All right. Mrs. Circle. I think I'm going to reverse the order because I okay. think once I do number one, you're not going to want to hear me anymore. Nope, that's fine. So I'm going to quickly talk about the other ones um, first. Um, the Delphi Community Elementary School successfully received Lighthouse status with the leader in me. So congratulations. Lots of hard work for that. <laughs> No. 
Nelson with the golf, went to regionals, didn't get through, but we were so very proud of him. He is a junior, so I can only imagine what he's going to be doing next year. Delphi Community School Corporation. This is outstanding the amount of people that are here tonight. So thank you very much coming to our board meeting. This presentation that you're about to see is about the great things that are happening at Delphi Community School Corporation and also we're going to look forward at our financial future. Sorry, I have a bad problem with my room, so I will try to stay by the microphone just for Debbie, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we have an awesome school corporation. We know that. We're, we live it. And one of the best things about our school corporation, one of the things that when I came here 12 years ago that was endearing to me, is the relationships that we have with our students. We know our students. We're small and mighty. And therefore, the staff, the administrators, we know each and every child. We know where they're sitting academically. We know their strengths, their weaknesses. We know where we need to differentiate. That is one of the key things that is wonderful about our school corporation. And ultimately, our goal is to create an environment that we are creating an atmosphere where our students can leave Delphi Community School Corporation and enter into a career or enter into higher education. We want them to be successful citizens, which requires a well-rounded education at our school corporation. And that's what we strive for. That's what's most important to us. Besides academics, we look at the education of the whole student. Leadership, collaboration, being a good citizen. And so we have several programs throughout our corporation, the Leader in Me, Character Strong that you're going to hear about today, and the Resilient Youth in each of our buildings that is fostering those other aspects that academics are very important, but we need the other things if we're going to make them successful citizens later on. We also have digital citizenship that we work on, and as you can see, we are a one-to-one -one school of technology, so we really focus on the fact that students know the technology, know safety with the technology, and incorporate it in our curriculum. Along with being a citizen in our, communication, in our corporation, we need to make sure that they are well-rounded, but Delphi Community School Corporation is nothing without that word community. It's in our name. So our community, this is a picture right here from the career fair. We had probably 50 different organizations from our community come out on a hot day, on a Friday, give up an entire day of work. And we have helicopters. I mean, it was incredible the cool. outreach from our community and the support from our community. It was an excellent day. So we want to continue having that strong working relationship with them. Um, along with that, we have other organizations within. We have the print shop within our building, which they partner with the community. They, they do banners and brochures. Our computer media class actually partnered with the chamber and did worked on a website for them and also did some videos and things for advertisement. So that's part of the, the joining with the community that's also giving them life skills. Another aspect that's extremely important is giving back to the community. And so we like to foster that spirit and we have service projects in all buildings and that's through that leader in me and the resilient youth. And here we have this is our students that were cleaning up one of the parks. Our football team cleans up the trails. But part of being a well-rounded come back to this community, be a part of this community, engage in this community, is making sure that they realize that giving back is a huge component. 
We also have a wide variety of academic opportunities for our students. In, that small, in a small district, that's hard. It is very difficult to have a vast variety of classes, but we maintain that we try to do that for our students and try to offer every class that we can because that's important to us. We pride ourselves on having advanced placement classes. We even are working on maintaining more certifications. Right now, our nurses, we have a CNA class that they walk out of here with having a CNA degree. And that's the opportunities we need to keep fostering. Uh, we also have uh, the opportunity for 24 dual credits and AP courses if our students are here that they may choose from if they so do. And that saves money from tuition. That is big savings. I know my daughter went off to college and she had the first semester was pretty much she could have taken no classes. We had one of our valedictorians, you will remember, he had a whole first year, had all of his credits. So that's important, that's key, that's dollars in our pocket. We're also looking at adding manufacturing uh, program next year. We're looking at how we can start implementing that because that's going to give us additional certification. And we have a lot of AP classes like AP Calculus. Uh, we've got Agribusiness. We also have AP Music Theory that we just started a year ago. And on top of that, we also look at being innovative. That, that's how we reach students. We've got to find that vessel where we can meet the students and find what really drives their passion. So we have a variety of clubs and activities. This is one that's nationally known, the bracketology. I think it started off with them, you know, sitting around looking at who's going to get picked for the, you know, NCAA tournament. And then all of a sudden, boom, this happened and they became national. But it wasn't just about this piece. They also were learning how to interact with media, data analysis statistical analysis, and public speaking. So even though they're enjoying it, they're learning. One of the big things that is kind of close to my heart, because I have a daughter who came here, I brought her over, and she was big in fine arts. And so I am so proud of the fact that our small school corporation has an extraordinary fine arts department in elementary, middle school, high school, all the way through. This right here is a critical component to our student success. Right here, um, our elementary art teacher, she started doing outreach in the community and she actually took our students down to Indianapolis and competed. And if you won't be surprised, they got first place in a lot of areas. Our high school also went down to Indianapolis and they had something called sticky note art work. Didn't really know that was a thing, but there was a whole art show on sticky notes. Everything was sticky notes and they had great success. So we are trying to make sure that our kids have these opportunities of the arts, the music, the drama all the way through. And as I said, one of the big things is my daughter came over here and I, we were at Tippecanoe County, so two of my daughters went through Harrison, and then I had my child that was here. My child here had far more opportunities than my two at Harrison High School. And you're going, how is that possible? Well, let me tell you. If she had been at Harrison, she would not have had leads in the musical. She would not have been varsity softball. You can come here and you can be well-rounded and you can get any passion and just go with it. And she's at Butler now in these areas because of this school corporation. Yeah. Just saying. <laughs> On top, we, we also have amazing sports. Here is our baseball team that has won regional once and three times sectionals. Uh, we, this year we won sectionals again. We fell a little short. We, had, we played Carroll. They are excellent as well. But we have an amazing extracurricular activities with all of our athletes and our athletic events. One of the things that's difficult in a small school is trying to maintain all those sports. How do you get all these kids to get into these programs? You know, Rossville, for example, they don't have a football team because it's just difficult to financially have all the athletic events. We actually had, I can't remember how long ago, you all, Mr. Smith might remember, but we were talking about cutting golf. I mean, we had three kids 
that were the team, and that was it. And so we had a whole discussion about, do we cut the golf program? Is it financially okay? Is it gonna help us if we just have three children? And we decided to go for it. And today, our golf program is excellent, and I just talked about Kate Nelson, who went to regionals. So we try and strive to meet all the students' needs in that way. Well, it is no secret the word referendum has been thrown around here at this corporation. Uh, my very first board meeting, very first one, the superintendent in July, we're sitting there, lovely financial presentation, you know, it was wonderful. And then our board president, Mr. Schwarzkopf, all of a sudden goes, well, we might have to have a referendum. And I looked at him like, what are we doing? This is my first board meeting. But it, we, we're gonna take a look, and that's why we're here today, because we have looked at our, in great detail, our financial future. And I'm gonna walk you through right now what are all the financials that are leading us in this direction and talk about the process. Okay, we're gonna have some exciting little bit of School Finance 101. So everybody just get ready, this is exciting. But it's, it's true, School Finance is so different than actual other, any other entities finance. So it's really important that you understand the different components of the School Finance. It gives you a, a grasp. So back in 2019, we had four little buckets, I call them buckets, but these are very cute, cute barrels, so I'm gonna keep saying the word bucket. But we had four funds. All of a sudden they decided, let's squish, so we're gonna put everything into two funds. There used to be what was called the general fund, that is now your education fund. And then we had capital projects, we had transportation, bus replacement, and that all is now, going to, is now our operation fund. So where is this money coming that goes into it? Okay, the education fund, which is the state basic grant. That is based on your enrollment. That is money per child that the state gives us. That's our blue money. Notice 85% of that goes into the education fund. In the education fund, think of that as the money that's spent on the classroom. The stuff that happens in the classroom. That's your teacher that's in front of them the instructional assistants that are in front of them, the resources that are there. This applies everything to make that classroom function. That is that blue bucket. And only those supplies and things can be sent out of the blue bucket. It even includes the benefits for those instructional staff. So where's the other 15% of that basic grant go? It goes into our operation fund, and there's a reason for that because there's other key important staff members that aren't exactly in the classroom, but they are important, such as your custodial staff, the bus driver. So they are important. Now they can't be paid directly over here, so the state has allowed us that we move some money over into operations because they're key. It isn't pretty if we don't have bus drivers. We all know that. So what else is there? In the operations fund, the rest of those colors, those pretty colors, are paid from property tax. That's your, your property tax base. And so now what we have is our bus replacement, our transportation, things like maintenance and, and all that good stuff. Um, our gas, the diesel, which is now 50% higher, and we're trying to figure out how to manage that. Your electricity, your internet, you know, all those fun things that you pay. And then of course our capital projects, which capital projects is anything under $6 million, you can do a capital project. I do want you to have a perspective here though. Our budget for operations is about 3.4 million. If we wanted to do a $6 million project, we don't have that money. Just putting them out there, okay? So understand, that's those, those buckets right there. Now there is this, there you go. Sorry, visuals take time. There, there is this cute little isolated bucket up there called debt service. This is an isolated fund, but it's very important. Just like all of you have mortgages on your house, 
and you're hoping at some point to retire and pay off the house and then you know you don't have that debt well school corporations they don't retire they keep educating so that debt cannot fall off so that debt service you know we can pay it down but we have to reinvest that debt and if we do that that's how we maintain our schools that's how we, we keep you know roof repair right now we've got hvac and pipes being done in the middle school high school which is why you're sitting here right now because the building's closed so we have all those things it is extremely important that school corporations pay their debt service because rating companies they don't like it and then that's going to devalue all of indiana schools so it's protected that's a protected fund Let's go ahead now, we're gonna actually dig into our biggest funding, which is the basic grant, which again is that blue bucket, we were talking about the blue money, and that is paid for by our enrollment per student. So take a look at this right here. This graph is funding for every traditional public, charter, and virtual school in the state. So we're dealing with 378. 72 corporations. Again, you're talking public, charter, and virtual because they all receive that state funding. The current funding ranges from $8,500 to all the way to Zionsville, that is 372, they're dead last, with $6,040 per child. That's how much they receive per child. Let's go ahead and look at our state average. You'll see how far they are from the state average because the state average is $6,771 per child. That's state average. So what are some other schools? Look at Frontier, they're 322 out of the 372. Clinton Central, 223. Benton Central, 187, they're at 6,000. Oh, they're getting closer. Culver's really close to that state average. And finally, you start seeing that Gary's up there. The highest fund for a public school is Gary at $8,202, by the way. So where is Delphi on that chart? Where is Delphi on that graph? They are 274 out of 372. That is 640, what, 644, $6,441 dollars, which is $330 below state average. And you're probably saying, well, $330 isn't that much. Well, if we actually had $330 more for every single child, we would actually be gaining $461,000 each year in funding. That is a lot. Can you imagine what we could do with $461,000 extra dollars? each year that's a lot just because we are not state average we are in fact very far below it so let me make sure i have my data correct here so as you look at these at, on the screen we have got all these schools have one thing in common except for delphi all of them have passed referendums and the reason I say this is because they realize that the state funding is not sufficient. The state funding is stagnant. And therefore, in order to keep the educational experiences for our students that they deserve, they have had to take the action and do referendums. Okay, let's take a look. This is an interesting graph. Um, this graph right here, you're gonna love it, I have to love it. But I'm gonna yell just because I have to point. Hey, you'll notice this is from 2010. Can you hear me, everybody? Yes, okay. Up to the current. Okay, this graph kind of just speaks to me because the legislature back in this area, all of a sudden they realized that they, there was funding. They, the state realized they were going broke. So they immediately were like, how are we gonna fix this? Well, of course they cut funding for education. So you can see the dip that was caused. And this isn't just Delphi. This was every single corporation in the state of Indiana all were hit with this. So this isn't unique to just Delphi. So I do want to tell you though, as this was happening, of course we had to do some things and very quickly, not good things happened. We riff teachers, which means we cut teachers. 
we cut several teachers and a lot of those teachers were programs like business i mean they were those extra they call them the extra classes because you gotta have math and english and science and social studies so guess what goes we cut fine arts we cut instructional coaches so all those things started to be cut just so we can make budget well take us back up here to 2022 and i want you to know something very important Notice the bars. We're just back to the same funding that we were back in 2010. Mm. Where, and of course, nothing got more expensive, right? <laughs> nothing. Nothing with inflation. So we have gained the fine arts and we've added some of these things back, but we haven't added everything back because honestly, our state funding is still an issue. Okay, this is another little fun graph. Okay, this back when, May 23rd, if you're at our board meeting, we had our financial consultants actually do a presentation of our status of what's going on financially going forward. And this right here shows the balance left in the education fund when you compare it to the revenue and the expenses. The first couple years are actual, like we have real data for those first couple of bars. But then we need to do an eight-year projection. I, I'm a kind of a planner, and I like to kind of look forward because I really don't want to be, you know, in trouble. So I don't like surprises. So we went forward and looked at our projection for the next, next eight years. If we didn't add any additional staffing, just nominal raises and an inflation of 3% annually, this is what we are looking at. Notice that going, um, this is not a good trend. So the financial consultants gave us a lot of different ways to look at this. But the biggest piece is, if you look at this, in the next eight year projection, if we just continue, continue status quo with the same revenue coming in, we are gonna be looking at it $14 million that we are going to be a deficit, which works out to about 1.8 million a year. That means we can't continue. Something's going to have to give. So we talked to the financial consultants and they talked about some little levers. That was a whole discussion in that other board meeting. So I don't want to go in it because you're already going, when is she going to be done? And so I'll just keep moving this way. Um, so we, we have controlled some of this and we're looking at ways we can continue to control. But there's no way we're going to be able with the 1.8 a year. We're not going to be able to control all that. So you know what's gonna happen, we saw the other graph. If we continue in that and we don't get additional funding, we're gonna to have to look at what programs we're gonna to have to minimize. And we don't wanna do that because our kids are worth it. So we need to talk about how we can get additional revenue. Therefore, there's only one lever to pull and that's where we start talking about a referendum. That's how that discussion came about. Now, there's some other variables that we need to discuss. Some good, some, some okay. But right now in our community, the number of school-aged children living in our district has actually dropped 7.7%. So, I mean, that's a factor. Because remember, our state funding comes from money for a child. So if there's less children in our school district, that, that causes a problem. So the chart then, we look at this chart right here. The number of students enrolled and living in the district has actually only dropped for us specifically 7% in five years. So that's okay, it's not the 7.7 that we were really worried about. But here's some good news. The number of students transferring to Delphi Community School Corporation has increased three times over the last five years. That has helped us, that has actually saved us in a lot of ways. Uh, that made overall that our enrollment has only dropped 2%. 2% is still big. In fact, if you look at the year 2022 and you compare it back to 2017, we are only down 18 students from that point. So why are they coming? They're coming because of the opportunities they have. Like I said about my daughter. My daughter coming here and she can participate and she can be involved. They're coming from the wonderful rela relationships that we have with students. A lot of people are coming here because of our amazing special education program. So they are coming. 
so if we cut programs are they still going to come that's the scary part because right now these transfer students are bringing in six hundred seventy thousand dollars so we need to keep our programs okay here's some things that we've done that i really appreciate and i really really enjoy we if you take a look back in 2017 we had kindergarten class that was 30 children or think about this little kids five and four year olds 30 of them in a class yeah no big deal yeah that's why i want to teach kindergarten but if you we started looking at this and we started looking at numbers of our class sizes and we really thought those are the optimal years of learning so the board made a decision that we need to make sure that those first years that they're here, that there is more one-on-one -on -one engagement with the, in the instructor in front. So we actually added sections to first or kindergarten, first, second, and third grade, which was key. So we went from average size of 27 to about average size of 22, give or take. We've got some classes right now that are a little bit lower. So that's great. The problem is, that ESSER, that was paid with ESSER money. Everyone got ESSER money during the pandemic. And so we made the executive decision that we were going to use the ESSER money to help lower those class sizes. Well, it gave us one section added from K to 3. It gave us, we added some more staff. We did cut our class sizes by one fifth, but this funding ends in 2024. So we're going to have to figure out financially is that what we want to do and what, how we want to stay. This one right here is another scary moment in my life, and that's talking about retention and attraction. I think every single one of us learned during the fourth quarter of COVID that kids really need to be in front of the teacher. I think we all saw that, but that was kind of key and important. So us retaining and attracting high quality educators is very important and near and dear to my heart because we all know that teachers make a difference. Every one of us can think back and think of that one teacher that made an impact on my life. We need to retain them. But here's what's happening. There's two things going on all at one time. One, the state mandated that we raise in the next two years, so it's next year has to be done, the minimum, what, the minimum salary for teachers to $40,000. Which, yes, they, we've been stagnant. Perfect, I agree. The problem is, we moved, the bottom, sorry, we moved the bottom up, but this middle group of teachers is still there. They're still there. So brand new teacher from you know Purdue University walks into our classroom and they start at $40,600, which is great, but right now in less than or equal, less than or equal to $40,600, we have 18 teachers with zero to eight years of experience. Yeah. That means that I've got staff members, we, we're all gonna own this, we have staff members who eight years they've been here and a brand new teacher, bright eyed and bushy tail, walks in and is making the same money they are. That, that makes teachers feel devalued and it doesn't help the culture. So this is important that we've gotta look at how can we fix this pattern here. We do have 60% of our teachers though have 10 or more years of experience, which is important because we know that if we can keep teachers and retain them, that's going to create a positive environment for our students. This one I really want to walk over here, but I'm worried about yelling. So this one scares me. This is a critical, critical concern for mine. First of all, when you come get a new job, you want housing. We are working on that. Thank you. To the redevelopment commission they are working on housing problem is right now there is not a lot of housing <clears throat> housing in delphi community school district so here comes in a brand new person to work for us and they can't find housing so of course they're going to move around the city of delphi well they'll typically tell you right now right down the heartland is booming with houses they've got thousands of houses so here comes this teacher living in Tippecanoe County, driving on the Heartland with all that gas. And at Tippecanoe County, they could be paid $43,950. Hopefully, no teachers are watching this presentation. 
because this right here scares me. But even now, like right now, 26 of our teachers with one to eight years of experience, they are actually less than TSC's starting salary. You can imagine what's happening. We are starting to have a problem with the revolving door. Even if they love us and we are great, because I know we're great, we are like amazing and wonderful, but I'm driving here and I live in Tippecanoe County. And we're fixing the housing problem, but it's gonna take a while. So teachers aren't the only ones that we're having problems with. We're also losing our custodial bus driver instructional assistants because our pay is just not competitive. It's not competitive at all. You can work at McDonald's. Now, granted, I wouldn't want to. Sorry, McDonald's. But you can work at McDonald's and get far more than working as an instructional assistant here. And here's my, my plight to everyone. If we're going to build all this housing, people are going to want to come here and they're going to want to work. And they're going to want to work in the community. And we're the second largest employer in this county. They're going to want jobs so they can actually have families and and live here and be here. We have got to be competitive. This year alone, this is teachers, custodians, cafeteria, it's everyone. We lost 50 people one year. We have 200, about 250 staff members. That's huge. But we can't have a revolving door. Revolving doors are only good like on hotels, those big fancy hotels. They are not good in school districts. It doesn't keep the consistency. We have got to do something to fix that problem. So, yeah, my new hires are like, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> you work with what? You got this. It's a team. We're going to pull together. Okay, so let's look at some other data on this. Um, one of the big, big things to look at is expenditures per student. So data from the Department of Ed, they, they keep track of how much the, each school corporation spends on their children. Um, so we're looking at 291 school districts before we had a different number because this time we were literally looking at just our public uh, public school corporations. Okay, so this is public funding. Okay, so on a per student basis, the state average is 13,751 per student. How much each school corporation is spending per student. Comparing local school districts, take a look at Bend County who has a referendum. <laughs> they're 49 out of 291 in terms of, you know, they're doing pretty well. They're almost up to the top of 16,000. Um, Delphi is 241 out of 291 school corporations on us and on how much we spend per child. And, and I hear this a lot saying, just tighten the belt. You know, come on, pull it, pull it. How much more can we pull in? We, we, are, we are tightened. That is, our kids deserve resources. They deserve the educational resources that other schools have. The only one that's lower is Pioneer. But I want you to take a look at where Pioneer is on the next slide. There's a reason. Uh, and I'm going to talk about this here in a second, but it, it's a big difference because if you notice, Delphi is continually at the same spot. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. So, another way to track expenditures spending is by expenditures based on per capita. The state requires that we report this for all entities, all local governmental ent entities, so you can find this online. A school district's per capita expenditure is the sum of all its expenditures for a given year divided by the school district's population. This gives us a better comparison of the efficiency of the school's spending to the ratio of, excuse me, as ratio to a taxpayer base. This is based on your taxes. The state average, as you see, is 2,143. And once again, the rankings are for the 200, 291 school corporations. Logansport has the highest, as you see there. And, and then they're within basically the top 10%. But where are we at? 228 out of 291 school corporations. Mm. That is considerably below spending in both of those 
areas. So we have tightened our belt, folks. We are tight. We, we, have, we are watching every penny. But you take a look and see Pioneer. Yeah, they were, they were low in the last category, but notice in this category, it's a different ball game. We're consistently low in folks. That's a problem. So, future of our funding. There are four things that I think as a corporation um, are key. And talking to staff members, this is the four things we thought why we're asking for help. We need help. One is the class sizes. We've already talked about managing class sizes. And I think that is instrumental. create the well-rounded students that are going to be productive citizens later on in life. So we've got to reach those facets. We also know, very sadly, what happened in Texas. We've got to continue to make sure our safety is up to par. That costs money. And finally, do not cut programming. We do not need to cut our programming. We need to keep it. We need to add more. We need to meet these needs of these kids academically and fine arts and all the extracurriculars. Our kids deserve it. We are starting the advanced manufacturing class. We want to start more. We need our kids to come here and be able to walk out of our doors and walk into employment. They deserve it. Therefore, after working with financial experts, analyzing our budget, looking at our school corporation needs, I am going to propose to the Delphi Community School Corporation School Board that if we want to maintain and develop our above programming, we are going to need to investigate a referendum. That looks scary. That's what the legislature's done, because that's how the ballot looks now. It's very scary. It's, it was not like that before. Eh, scary and confusing. Okay, so let's talk about it. I'm going to propose that we raise just under 1.2 million. If you saw that other slide, it said we were 1.8. But I think with us pulling some of those levers, we can keep it, we're trying to keep it at, at, at a reasonable rate. If we can do it. Obviously the 1.8 is gonna be where, I mean, we can do it with the 1.2. So that's what we're asking for. You saw in that slide. Again, the financial advisor mentioned several levers, and we researched it, and we think we can be solvent with the $1.2 million. Okay, speaking of the scary ballot language, let me try to decipher some of this. Um, I talked about the legislature passed this, so I already got there. It's scary. The underlying sections are the only components we have any say in. That's it. Just those little underlying sections. So. We, we looked at the eight year mark, just because we talked about that over eight years, dividing it out, that's how we came up with the 1.2 million. Those, that underlined is those four little pie pieces I just showed you, the things that we would spend on, you know? And then we've got this property tax rate, which is right now, and again, it'll go to the auditor, so we need to make sure if we decide to go forward with this, it is 0 0.2032 cents. Now, there's some other things in there that are really scary, like there's this 21.9% thing going on, and people read that and they're like, oh my gosh, my tax rate's going up 21.9, because that's what I would say if I was reading this ballot. That's not what that's reading. That is actually saying, 
it's for the school corporation per year on residents would increase. It's actually talking about what the difference is in the school corporation and how much they're going from where they were to where they are now. It's a complicated for formula. Mm. If you really want reality, a taxpayer in Delphi City, because in our district, that's the most, the highest tax rate is within our Delphi City. They pay those highest amounts and they would see an increase of about seven and a half.